What's up, Joe? What's up, everybody? Jeff Fennell with you again, Sports 360. Today, Larry Williams returns to talk about the Zion Williamson injury and whether this should finally lead to college athletes being paid. We'll also talk about the likely end of one and done and whether this is a good or bad thing for the NBA. So stay right where you are and we'll be right back with Larry Williams on Sports 360. Well, I'm pleased once again to have with me Larry Williams uh, on our weekly segment where we just, you know, talk all things hoops, um, NBA, college, you name it, we'll get into it. And and certainly right now there's a lot going on. NBA All-Star Game is over. We're into the second half of the season and all kinds of excitement related to that. But this week, L-Dub, I want to talk about uh, some college basketball. So, um, but before we get into that, how are you doing today? You, uh, are you uh, recovered from last week's All-Star festivities? I guess as well as I can, man. I'm recovered, but uh, still work to do, as they say. It's never yeah. Finished. How did you enjoy it overall? How, how was the experience uh, this time around in Charlotte? Actually, it was great. The people of Charlotte was great. The whole atmosphere was great. I mean, uh, every, every event was competitive. Uh uh, the dunk contest still is, I think, still needs to be worked on. But other than that, uh, everything was great. Everything. Yeah. You know, and speaking of the dunk contest, the only thing I would have to say is, and I don't know what you can do about this, but guys have to make their dunks. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, the air kind of goes out of the building when you see a guy repeatedly missing his dunk. And, you know, look, I can't even dunk, so I'm not trying to be critical here, but it's just point of fact. You know what I mean? When you see a guy missing his dunks, it kind of takes the air out of out of the uh, out of the arena. So, um, but uh, that kid from um, from the Thunder, I don't know his name. Uh, who I think he won the contest, right? I mean, he was yeah, the kid from Kentucky. Yeah, he yeah, played he, was really, he was really good. I mean, he was really. Um, you know, it was uh, he put on a little bit of a show. So but I agree. But I think the dunk contest is one of the hard events because if it works, it works. But if um, the creativity isn't there or guys are missing their dunks, it's kind of hard to watch. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then you still get a 49 if you dunk it after the fifth try. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean I, I don't care how creative. I'm, I'm still upset that you missed the first four. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, um, well, I I want to talk about something, um, you know, that happened on this week. There's been a lot of coverage on it, and uh, we're going to delve into a little bit. And that is, you know, what we saw at Cameron Indoor Stadium this week when Duke and North Carolina got together, and Zion Williamson. Right? I mean, we weren't even what 40 seconds into the game and you know he sprained his knee um and in the process i mean he literally just broke his shoe right and he sprained his knee and first of all i'm gonna ask you have you ever seen something like that not just a a player coming out of his shoe because we've seen that but a player getting injured because he's come out of his shoe and in particular what went through your mind when you saw Zion Williamson, who is the phenom of phenoms this year, right, lying on the floor in pain. Never, never saw that happen in the NBA or a college basketball in my life. I've seen it happen on the playground, you know, because the guy had a pair of cheap shoes, but never because, you know, uh, having a great shoe on playing a college game, I've never seen that. And the first thing that went through my mind again was, you remember in the interview I saw a month ago with but it's Scottie Pippen. And to me at the time, I just, I, I, you know, I had different emotions. I said, Scotty, why do you just say that? You know, because we all played college ball and we said, you know, I, I want to win a championship. I want to be with my friends. You know, that's wherever you were at that time in your life, you know, at 18, 19, 
you you wasn't really thinking about the big picture. You just loved basketball. So when Scotty said it, I kind of was like, eh, that, that's something tough to say. But soon as I saw Zion do that, I reverted back to say, man, Scotty may have had a point uh, because this kid could have ruined his career. Not not just be hurt for a game or two. This kid could have ruined his career. He could have tore his groin, you know, tore his ACL. He could have been done. Uh, so that's what I reflected back to when I did it and, you know, which – brought up the conversation you know is one and done really the best thing you know for kids you know if they're that good why can't they go straight you know to the nba right right and and for those who may not realize right when you when you're talking about scotty pippen back in january before zion got hurt pippen was on record of saying that Zion should shut it down, that he has no more to prove. He should, you know, shut it down, avoid injury and just get ready for the draft. And there were a lot of people who didn't agree with Scotty. And that's what you're referring to. So that now when Zion is lying there on, in, in pain, you know, uh, Pippen's comments come back to the forefront and, you know, made him seem like, OK, well, maybe Scotty has something there. You know what I mean? Because. Uh, as you said, I mean, Zion could have suffered a, a career ending injury. And Correct. certainly that, you know, every player, when they step on the court or they step on the field, step on the ice, that could happen to them, you know, even at the college level. But, um, you know, when you see players who clearly could play professionally being denied the opportunity to play because of some rule, um, if that player was were to suffer a catastrophic injury and now his career is over, that would be that would be a travesty. And um, so we're going to get into that, too, because there's some movement on on the one and done point. But let, let's talk about something else related to that game, if we could, though. Right. And that is that game. I've heard people say they were like Super Bowl prices for some of the tickets for those games. Right. I mean, four thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars and. All kinds of things, right? It was star-studded. President of the United States, you know, uh, Bar uh, Barack Obama was there. And Floyd right. Mayweather and all these other celebrities were there. And so a lot of people were making a lot of money off that game, not only on ticket prices, but the sponsorship, TV, you know, everybody. Everybody except the players, right? Um, and so what do you think about that? Because, you know, it to me, this whole scenario with Zion brought back to the forefront another issue, and that is should players who are generating all of this revenue share in the revenue? I, I totally believe that players should be uh, compensated for the revenue that they bring into college, especially football and basketball nowadays. And I'm not I don't know the answer to how you're going to divide it up amongst players, who gets what, what, you know, but, but something has to be done for these kids, you know, are compensated for their time and, and, and the, the revenue that they're actually, you know, making for these universities and, and all, I mean, some high schools, I mean, you know, some high schools are generating their revenue, but I know they're not going to go that far, but definitely, college players, athletes, I think should be paid. Yeah. And we're just going to have to figure it out. You know, what, what, what does that look like? You know, LW, you know, one of the things I often think about, and I, and I don't want to get the player's name wrong, but I believe it was Shabazz Napier who played for UConn a few years back. Correct. And, and he, you know, and this was the year that UConn won the championship and he talked about how many times he went to bed hungry because he didn't have money to buy food. Right. And that led to some changes in terms of some stipends being made available to athletes. You know, we talked about the cost of attending and, and, and those types of things and, and some modifications being made. But, you know, when you consider the tremendous amounts of money that these young uh, athletes are helping 
so many other people, the conferences, the NCAA, uh, the, the broadcasters, and on and on and on. A lot of people are getting rich off the backs of these players, and something like that just simply shouldn't be allowed to continue to happen. Right. And, and, and it's, been, it's been going on for a long time, uh, Jeff. And, and, the, and the problem I see with that is so many people that are weighing in that have that don't even understand first of all a college kid has got the same workload as any student that goes to school and matter of fact in some schools they stress it so much that you know teachers don't don't be light on athletes some teachers are harder on athletes you know just making sure you know that they get the lessons not only that these kids have to they're obligated to be at practice uh travel they, you know, again, they have to take their homework with them. They don't get the same amount of time for tutoring as everyone else because of their schedule that goes on. People think basketball is only three months, but actually for an athlete, basketball is year round because you're always training to get better. And, and, you know, that time has to be dedicated. So really there's more pressure on an athlete than a normal student who just goes to class you know, uh, to college, you know, to, to get their degree. So that in itself, you know, is, is, is enough pressure that says, hey, you know, this kid is doing more. He's providing uh, revenue for the school where generating revenue for the school where a normal student who goes there is not generating any revenue. I mean, so those things, but the people who are making decisions, not often, you know, are not, you know, Athletes, should I say? They're just people who come up with a a plan or, or, or think or make decisions based on you know what's going to be better for them, and that's where a lot of the problem lies. You know, it, it, you 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 have to be empathetic to understand what goes on with a a normal day, you know, for an athlete getting sure. up early, you know, staying up later, working out, you know, putting your body through rigors you know, conditioning, and then going out there to represent all those people that are sitting in those stands cheering for you. Right. Yeah. Right. No no question about it. Now, um, so here we are, though. If we go back to Zion, right, because Scotty was talking about Zion should shut it down, you know, before he even got hurt. And, right. you know, Zion is viewed, right, almost universally, right? He will be the number one pick in the NBA draft, barring something <laughs> totally unexpected happening, right? Um, but now that he has suffered an injury, and, and you know, right now the report is, is that it's a mild strain and he's day-to-day. But now that he has suffered an injury, do you think he should continue to play and, you know, play into March Madness and all the rest of it? Or in your opinion, should he shut it down at this point? Actually, again, that, that I think we touched base on this before. That's something he and his family, and, you know, I heard someone say his agent and advisor. I know I think that's something he and his family, because I don't know Zion's, you know, family background. I don't know, you know, their financial needs or or or, or if they're the most wealthiest people in the world. I, I don't have any knowledge of that. So therefore, anyone that doesn't have knowledge of that shouldn't be quick to judge or make an opinion or a decision for Zion. He has to do what's best for him and his family. And, and, and if that means uh, not, you know, not playing anymore for Duke, I, I think right now that game alone has probably paid what Zion was given this year, you know, for, for college, the money that that school paid for Zion to go to school this year. That, 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 that game that you saw the other night probably was 25 to 30 times over. And it could have been more than that. I'm just, I know at least 20 to 30 times over, you know, what all those scholarships were worth. <laughs> you know, at that point. So he don't owe sure. the, school anything. the school don't owe him anything. It is his decision. And and that's the only way I can see it. And I did. I thought about a lot of different angles 
but at the end of the day, it comes down to what he and his family needs. Yeah. And, you know, I asked that question because, you know, Jalen Rose, who is someone who, uh, you know, uh, one of the Fab Five, you know, from back in the day. And, you know, um, you know, he's on ESPN and and, and so forth. And I saw him this week and, um, you know, he said that he expressed his view that Zion, if he's able to play, from, you know, come back from this injury, then he should play. And he started talking about, well, he signed a letter of intent and he should honor his commitment and all this. <laughs> and and I hear that, you know, and I hear him saying that. And then I think about, you know, that that the college football player at Ohio State, right, Nick Bosa, hmm. who got hurt in September, was expected to be able to play in November. But he decided, I'm shutting it down and I'm preparing for the draft. And whether or not, and I hear your point, whether or not it's it's up to anybody to say anything about his decision, that's his decision to make. But the point was, his decision was like almost universally met with approval. Correct. And so I look at that a little bit and not saying that Jalen Rose is like, you know, speaking for everyone. But I kind of looked at both of those situations and I thought to myself, what's the difference? Do you see any difference between Bosa and, and the Zion Williamson situation right now? And, and that there lies the hypocrisy of sports itself. Uh, you know, just one person can do something. And, and I'm talking about they, the, 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 the fan base, the media and everyone was like, hey, be easy on this kid, Bosa, Nick Bosa. You know, he's making a good decision. And here's a guy, his brother, previous two two years ago, or two, I think it was two years ago, his brother was the first was the first pick also of the Chargers, first round pick, and made millions of dollars. So it's not like he's coming from a poor environment, you know, not like he 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 needs to go out and make all this money. But no one, no one had a negative thing. Even the coach, Myers, coach Myers, uh, Urban Myers was like, Hey, you know, if that's what he feel he has to do, you know, yeah, we would like him to come back, but if he doesn't, Hey, we're, we're, we're prop, we're, we're cool with the decision he made. Now here you are. And coach K even said he was understood that Zion had to make his own decision and he was good with any decision he makes. And I think the book stops there. <laughs> if the coach says, you know, he's okay. If the family says he's okay, then it's everyone else should just be okay. You know, you can't change anything anyway, whether you want to or not. You know, it's their decision. And I think we should support people instead of always, you know, giving our two cents to, to belittle them for, for the decision that they make. And, you know, that's one thing I talk to you about, about myself. I, I, I really try not to put anyone down. I don't care if it's someone I don't like. You know, I'm not a fan of, uh, I don't want to put them down because, you know, I don't need to put someone down to build myself up. And I feel a lot of these people do that. They, they, they put people down to build themselves up. But in Zion's case, uh, everyone saw that. And I guarantee you when it happened, everyone that saw Scottie Pippen's interview a month ago in January, I guarantee they all reverted back to that day. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just a human, you know, instinctive factor that we do. And we all said, man, that kid might, you know, need to need to stop. Because, well, first of all, Nike had never seen a, a athlete like this guy before. So, you know, I'm quite sure Nike shoes are a great shoe. And I'm quite sure they're still going to, you know, sell. Matter of fact, they may even sell more because controversy seems to always trigger things. But, I mean... How do you prepare for a 280-pound mm. kid that can run, jump faster than anybody you've ever seen? Yeah. You know, I mean, quick twitch is quicker than most guards. I mean, right. that, that's, that's still to be discovered. Yeah, but so, you know what, though? I will tell you this. You know, first of all, yeah, you're right. I mean, look, Nike, I believe, will recover from this. But I will <laughs> tell you what. That image of him, of Zion, lying on the floor in pain with his foot sticking out of a broken Nike sneaker (laughs) was not a good look for Nike. I tell you that right now. (laughs) That was not a good look. And I can imagine 
you know, uh, uh, Under Armour and, and New Balance and Adidas and everything else oh, saying, okay, oh, really yeah, going out. <laughs> yeah, do you want this to happen to you? But here's the other thing, though, and it, 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 this is something I think about as well, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the, the schools or the coaches of the teams have deals with these apparel companies and the players have to wear the apparel, including the sneakers, of of whatever company the coach has a deal with. So, first of all, if that's right, and if that's right, then that would mean an athlete who may not want to wear Nike, but if you're playing for a Nike school, you have to wear Nike. And well, I just, well that, that's already decided, you know, even when they have AAU, EBU, you know, EYBL, is Nike, then you got the Adidas circuit, then you got so so kids have already decided where they want to go when they do that. So, uh, so 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 if a kid so so this is helpful then for me to understand. So then so if I'm if I'm a kid and I prefer, you know, Adidas or something like that, right? Then I'm not going to accept a scholarship to a Nike school because I'm an Adidas guy. Hey, you saw all those guys getting in trouble for 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 bringing, you know, for paying kids and mm-hmm. driving them to school. That ninety percent of that, I guarantee you, was 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 just what you just asked about. Mm. Hey, go to this school. We're gonna pay you this here because you are representing Adidas, Nike, you know, and these are the schools that wear Adidas. These are the schools that wear Nike. You know, blah blah blah. The X Y Z. Wow. And that uh, starts. You said that at the AAU level. Yes, it does. It, you know, so that's that's why they're broken up. You have the you know the Adidas gauntlet, the, the circuit that Adidas people who are sponsored by Adidas play on, and then you got the gauntlet for Under Armour that they play on. Then you got the EYBL that Nike plays under, and all those kids right then and there start the peril is exactly whatever circuit you're on. Wow. Now, one of the things with Zion, and I just want to touch on this real briefly because, you know, a few months back, you know, I had a guest on his uh, by the, a lawyer by the name of Richard Giller, um, who deals in loss of value insurance uh, that covers athletes, uh, including college athletes who may suffer, you know, a, a illness or injury that, um, you know, keeps them from some of their expected earning potential. Um, and I did see that Zion had an $8 million policy, according to the report, uh, $8 million policy that would be triggered if because of a serious illness or injury, he fell outside of the top 16 picks in the next draft. So, um, there is some cushion there, you know, for a player like Zion, because most of the time it's only going to be the elite athletes in college who can get these policies. But um, it still doesn't make up for the fact, in my opinion, of, you know, you know, if if he would have gotten hurt and his career was over, he would have lost untold amounts of money. Um, and it brings us to the one and done. Right. Let, let us talk about that, because whether it was coincidence or not. The NBA, the very next day, and I don't think it was because of Zion, but the next day, a report came out that the NBA had uh, made a, an official proposal to the MBPA, the union, to lower the draft age from 19 to 18, effectively getting rid of one and and, and done. Um, a lot to talk about here, but let's just start with the basics. What's your view of that, of the of the proposal to get rid of one and done. Well, I'm just going to read a, a quote that DeMarcus Cousin, who was a one and done, and like I said, the best way to get an answer for someone is someone who's done that. And and DeMarcus Cousin, you know, being what he is in the NBA, DeMarcus Cousin said basically, the, you know, the one year in, in Kentucky didn't close to get him ready for the NBA. He said so. I, he didn't understand. He don't understand why there's a big fuss that Zion doesn't just jump straight to the NBA. The one person that he brought to mind to reference that was LeBron James. He said here's a guy that you know was built like uh, Zion and jumped straight from the NBA, and he's one of the top two or three best players of all time, depending on how generous you feel about it on a given day. He said, but uh, 
you know, he knows personally college did, you know, the, the one year at Kentucky didn't get him ready for the rigorous, you know, uh, grind that he had to put in when he got to the, to the NBA. So he felt he was a year behind. So that's hmm. someone who's, who's done it. And, and not only has he done it, that this kid is, he's in the top, Ooh, uh, centers, he, he, he's, you know, one or two in the NBA right now, you know, centers. Sure. But players wise, you know, that, that kid's still in the top 10, you know, players, uh, yeah. in the NBA. I think Demarcus Cousins, his potential is, is, is unlimited. But, uh, Again, if I could say something right there, because that's an interesting comment, because and I, and I don't want to pile on Jalen Rose, but he did say something else about why Zion should play. He said, if Zion comes back and plays, he's going to continue to play for one of the best coaches, best basketball coaches ever in Mike Krzyzewski, as opposed to if he goes into the NBA. And I'm just saying what Jalen said. He's going to be playing for a lottery coach. So he will end up getting better coaching if he stayed and finished out his collegiate year, just his freshman year, than if he shuts it down now. So this way he can continue to prepare to go to the next level. What do you think of that comment? Uh, And see, that's all. I mean, mean, he's entitled to his opinion. But I beg to differ. I, 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 I mean, you look at someone like uh, Zion. We understand how big he is, but but, but you see, he he still has baby fat. He still has you know some stuff that needs to be honed down. If you was to train with an NBA trainer, someone who understands you know what it's going to take, and, and that's what their profession is, they're they're going to put you through things stimulating that like like you're on the court. And they have technology is so technology is so defined now that you know you can simulate anything you wanted to simulate. And if he was doing this constantly, he would be physically and mentally more prepared. Not to say he will he will understand the game anymore. Now I think that's what Jay Jalen was alluding to that he would understand why you know you, you do this, why you do that. But that's gonna come instinctively with you know once he gets there you know you can't you can't tell me what you're going to do tomorrow at three o'clock you don't know you got to wait till tomorrow at three o'clock to know what you're going to do tomorrow at three o'clock even if you come up with a plan you may not do it exactly like you said it's going to be but you'll figure it out and that that's what Zion would do so I'm not I mean again I I would disagree with that uh, I, I think if he did it correctly you know if he worked out perfectly and, and correctly, he, he, he would be better suited, you know, and he would be in better conditioning. Because if he keeps playing, I don't care who you are, if you ever had an ailment and you keep playing on it, you, you don't get better by playing on, on that ailment. You get worse. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, so he may need that time to really be ready if he wants to come into the NBA and make an impact. Now, if he just wants to be in the NBA, then – Okay, I mean, that's why I'm saying those are decisions Zion would have to make because no one's in his mind. No one knows what this kid is thinking. He may want to be the greatest. His first year, he may want to outdo LeBron James. No one knows that. So if he does, he can't do it coming into the league, you know, 80%. It's not going to happen. And, you know, you're so busy come time after, you know, after the season is over, which you're so busy with all the stuff that you're preparing for. You don't really have the time to, to train like like you would if he was to stop now. And like mm-hmm. I said, I'm not, I'm not insinuating that he should stop. I'm not insinuating that he should play. I'm only saying whatever he decides, it has to be his decision and he has to live with it. And right. no one else can be upset. Right. Well, now you mentioned LeBron um, and, you know, on the topic of one and done, if we can go back to that. Uh, you mentioned LeBron. Um, and uh, you and I have spoken about, you know, some of the um, information and research you've done on one and dones. And, and certainly there have been a lot of players b- before the rule was changed, right, who came straight out of high school. LeBron's one of them. Kobe's another. KG's another. And there's been others who have been tremendously successful. 
right? So it's not as if um, there's not some history there and some precedent there that players can indeed, um, you know, make the transition and be some of the best players in, in the league. And then there's also, you know, the Corleone Youngs, right, who didn't make it. But I don't know if you're ever going to have a 100 percent success rate in any profession. Um, so, you know, share what you can a little bit on the history of, of the one and dones and, and, and then just also your thoughts on, you know, what you see coming uh, forward when uh, when and if uh, the rule gets rolled back. Okay, just you, you know, you, you know, we had the the actual uh, draft where you come straight out of high school. And for those kids that did it, a lot of them, you know, were what they call bust. You know, the terminology. I don't know what a bust is because if you was drafted number one, that you know, I don't, I don't know how you could label a bust. You know, right? It, just, it should have been. It should have been titled. I made a bad decision. You know, <laughs> I mean, not, not, <laughs> evidently that kid showed you something that was other people didn't show you. So how did he become the bus? But anyway, uh, that's what they said. They titled it bus. So that was one of the reasons they that was one of the reasons that they they, they hinted at that they were going to stop the one and done because you paying all these players all this money and you didn't know what they would materialize into. The other reason that a lot of it went away was because, you know, you get a kid 18 and he, let's say he plays, let's use Rashad Lewis for an example. And I, and I, I love Rashad. So that, I mean, I'm using him as, as, as a perfect example. No one can say he wasn't a great player. No one can say he uh, didn't perform, but Rashad played to what about 30, 32 or 30, 30 some years old. He played. So that means Rashad, his first year, he got that. He got he was a lottery pick, so he got you know they consider that like a, a max deal because you're a lottery pick. So t- when he turned 21, he was eligible for another max deal, which he got. So that was at 21. At 24, 20 between 24 and 25, he got another max deal. Uh, I I don't think he got the third max deal, but he got a lot of money. And then, and then his last deal was, you know, you saw he ended up getting a championship with the, with the uh, Miami Heat, and he, you know, kind of rode off into the sunset. Now that's a lot of money when you think about max deals of giving a player, you know, a hundred some a hundred some million dollars every time you give him a contract. You know, that's a lot of money to give somebody, and they they saw that being a factor and they said, man, if we could just back this thing up one more year, you know, we would slim down, you know, that max deal from possible four max deals to a possible three. And the chances are that last one won't be a max deal because he's, you know, kind of at the end of his, 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 uh, his age, you know, the age limit where mm-hmm. you have to give a max deal. The guys start playing for the, you know, veteran minimum. And, uh, that was a big reason that the, the, the one and done, you know, I mean, the straight out of high school stop. And, and people, you know, a lot of people don't know, but one year makes a big difference in basketball terms uh, for that reason, you know, with the way they have the collecting bargain agreement and the max deal that you can get. And now that you can get 10% more with the same team, you know, you know, that they thought that would keep guys on a team. But after I got two max deals and I got $200 million or more in my pocket, you know, now I'm chasing championships. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. you know, right. I'm not taking money no more. So that's what you're seeing right now. And they didn't expect that. You know, they thought guys would just be chasing the money. But these guys now say, I got the money. I want the rings. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's causing a problem. So yeah, uh, as far as, you know, keeping players, you know, uh, or should I say keeping balance of power in the NBA. So, yeah. So, so on that point, though, so that's interesting. So, because if if the if the age gets dropped from nineteen to eighteen, and we you know, so now we go back to the situation where players can come straight out of high school. That is something that's going to benefit players. It's going to be good for the union and all the rest of it. But this happens in the context of a negotiation, right? You're an agent, you're, you know, you negotiate, you know, I negotiate. And one of the things we understand as negotiators 
if you're going to get something, you're going to have to give something. So what is it that you think the NBA would be looking to get from the union in exchange for the the age dropping from 19 to 18? And, and again, I, 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 the only thing I can uh, even, you know, we talked about this a little and I told you, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to see where they're going. But the only thing I could think of is by, you know, I say keeping parity, you know, in, in, in the lead so that it generates the revenue that they're like they're getting they're getting the, the thing that people really don't understand is the nba is able to pay all these people believe me they're making all that much more money so it's, it's so much money being made outside of basketball by the basketball players jersey sales uh you know the the, the endorsement every time you see the nba logo you know, someone's paying the NBA, and it goes on and on. So there's so much money being generated, you know, to the NBA by these players and and all this endorsement that they're able to pay these players. But in order for you to keep the public watching, it has to be some type of parity. So what I'm thinking is they're going to say if you get a max deal or something, you would have to stay with your team, you know, as opposed to, you know, jumping you know, to another team like a lot of these players doing. Because that's the only thing that I see that they're having, you know, a problem with, seem like they're having a problem with. Uh, you know, in the situation with Anthony Davis right now, uh, whether he wants to leave to go for whatever reason, you know, they're all, the the the, 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 the big wigs, the front office is all saying, you know, that, that comes from all these players want to play with their, 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 their friends or, or their partners or people, uh, that they have the same agents in life. It, it just was reported that Bradley Bill said while he was at the All-Star game, he was trying to recruit people to come to play with him at Washington. Now that John Wall's hurt, he's saying John's going to be okay, but we need, you know, a big, a big guy. So he was trying to recruit, you know, players at the All-Star game while he played. Bradley Bill was an All-Star and he, he don't think he wasn't passing the ball to certain people. Trying to say, yeah, you can be doing this to Washington Wizards. I mean, that the business that, and the, those guys know that. They know that. They they know people are running to hop to play, but every team, you know, knows that you need about three superstars or three big name players in order to, to compete, and it's got to be you know quality players. And with John Wall being hurt, Otto Porter just being traded, you know. Otto was supposed to be the defensive guy, the, the all-around guy for uh, Washington. Now, you know, they're they're up, they're dismantled, and you know, they are all in disarray. You know, wondering what they're going to do. So, 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 but you think though that the in exchange for reducing the age from nineteen to eighteen, that the NBA would look to somehow limit. And it remains to be seen. There's a lot of ways that it can be done. Yeah. Limit the players' ability to to move from one team to the next, or somehow maybe extend the amount of time that it, that you know uh, a player would have to be with a team after they sign a deal. Yes, it, it, it's probably going to be something similar to that. Uh, you know, that I'm, I, that's coming from my opinion. Other than that, I mean, I don't, I don't really know much. You can change, you know, in it, you know, like I said, they're already agreeing to amend it, you know, so because it's not supposed to be uh, in this collecting bargain agreement wasn't supposed to end until 22. So that means for them to go in now and both agree, they would have to amend things, and and it's it's not. I mean, you can't amend. You know, players ain't gonna stand for you to amend the money. The only thing they can say is, hey, okay, now. We're gonna, if you sign, you're going to have to stay with this team for X amount of years. Uh, you know, just can't have you just jumping from team to team because, you know, that's, that's your fan base. Uh, perfect example again, last night, Lamar LaRose and them, my, uh, the Toronto Raptors played the Spurs again. When Kawhi Leonard went to, went back to, uh, San Antonio, the fans booed him. I mean, it goes for their understanding. This kid, this guy was the MVP of, a world championship that helped the Spurs when Tim Duncan was down 
you know, they they, they were older and, and couldn't couldn't get it. He won a championship for San Antonio. These people booed him. DeMar DeRozan has never won a championship. He took them to the to the finals, you know, you know, to the East Coast Finals, and then they lost to LeBron, and you know, in, in, in a horrible fashion. And this guy is praised and celebrated. They probably gonna build a building for this guy, <laughs> for this guy in Toronto. No, yeah, but but again, now had he stayed in Toronto, do you know the revenue that he would generate? No different than we talk about Zion in college. It's the same way in the NBA. If a if a team if a player stays long enough and he does stuff in the community and people get behind him, they're going to support that guy. And yeah. that's what the, that's what we talked about last week. Man, these kids are doing some things in the community that people don't even talk about. All they talk about is what they do on the court. But these kids, Lamar DeRozan, evidently he 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 took. Toronto to another level with stuff he did in the community and the people he reached and those people love him. Yeah. But, but that, that really points out something though, that while that's all good and it's great that players can, you know, and all players are doing things in their communities, you know, right. or the vast majority of them are in their NBA communities and even in their communities from which, you know, they, they were born and everything else. But it really is interesting. You raise an interesting point because you're right. You know, San Antonio fans were all over Kawhi Leonard when he came back because yeah. Kawhi Leonard was saying, I want out of here. Right. He wanted to be traded. We know the, you know, the saga that was last year. Uh, DeMar DeRozan got traded. Right. And he didn't want to be traded. He wanted to stay there. And so I think that's part of the process, too. Right. That Kawhi Leonard says, I want out of here. So now when he comes back, he gets booed. DeMar DeRozan says, I never wanted to leave. And he's, and he's loved, he's beloved. Um, but there's a danger in that, in my opinion. And, and the danger is, you know, to the extent that players are not allowed to move or their, their ability to move is restricted. That has a direct effect on earning potential because one of the things I've learned along the way is you have to be talented, but all these guys are talented at the professional level, but the ability to move is directly related to your ability to earn. Because if you, if you're able to move from one team to another, that means you have the ability for teams to bid on your services, which then means you can go to the highest bidder if you want to. But if you can't move, if you have to stay, in a certain place, then your earnings also are going to be restricted. It's the difference between being in a free market and having no market. And so, yeah, I'm all for, you know, there being parity and all that, but right. players have to be careful that they still have the ability to move, you know, and it's not too restricted because, you know, the career of an NBA player doesn't go on forever and they have to maximize their earning potential. So it's going to be interesting if you're right, that there's going to be this move by the NBA to maybe add another year. You, Hey, you got to stay here a little bit longer. Players have to think long and hard about that because I believe earning potential is tied to movement or the ability to move. Right. No, I, I mean, Again, that goes to the, like you said, the give and take. You know, you, you know, you, you're still giving the kid the opportunity to come in 18. And, and believe me, if, 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 the, if the most ever was, was six, six guys drafted out of high school in one year, then trust me, if it starts up again, it, it's going to get up to about 10. You know, because mm -hmm. the guys are better now. They they jump higher, they run faster, and they 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 do the same training that some of the pros do now. You know, back in the day, you know, hardly would you ever see a professional athlete in your neighborhood when we you and I were growing up. Now, I mean, your kids, my kids, you know, whomever kids, they they live in an area. They probably live next door to 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 an athlete, so they're getting taught and. What are y'all doing in practice? We do this. Hey, no, nah, nah, you're doing it wrong, little fellow. Do it like this. And pretty soon, these kids are doing the same thing mm. that they at NBA camps or, or NFL camps or, or Major League Baseball camps. And these kids are picking up a lot quicker, you know. So 
again, with, with technology, you know, everything is enhanced and it's, it's done a lot quicker. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask and, you and this. You, oh, go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. No, but you know what was interesting? We talking about this one and done. I, you know, I, you know, again, doing the research, you thought I thought about it. This, this has been going on since 1962. That was the first, you know, 1962. Reggie Harding was the first player. Uh, Detroit Pistons drafted him two years in a row. I guess they drafted him. He didn't come the first year. Next year he did. Uh, 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 either, and I'm, I'm not sure in 62 because I was only one, but, uh, m- maybe they drafted him. He came in and somehow he, he became a free agent again or something else. I don't know, but they say he, drafted, he was drafted twice. So I, I'm trying to figure out how did that happen. They drafted him twice. Uh, so anyway, he started. Since that inception, there's been, there's 13 guys that, that, that are still playing out of the 44. And out of the 44, you know, I, I would take, they saying the bust is somebody probably from 37 on down. You know, so so you had all seven footers, seven footers except for two, from from thirty seven to forty four that were bust. You had Ricky Sanchez, uh, uh, Sawana Dot from Oak Hill Academy, uh, Sanai Singh, Leon Smith, Leon uh, Smith from uh, Martin Luther King in Chicago, Colin Colin Young, James Lang. Indy Abbey from the high school I coached at, uh, Westbury Christian. And then the guy, I've never heard of this guy. Uh, C-I-S-S-E. This Osman, I, I've never heard of him, but he was the 44th guy from St. Jude, uh, that was taken. So I guess that's what they are considering a bust. But okay, so you say 30, 33 guys weren't a bust and there are 13 of them still playing now. You know, in in the NBA, actively still playing, and those people are LeBron James, Dwight Howard, Lou Williams, Al Jefferson, uh, Josh Smith, Jr. And, and when I say still playing, they they could be playing in China or somewhere, but they're still actively playing. Jr. Smith, Gerald Green, Tyson Chandler, uh, Andre Bloch, he's playing in China. C.J. Miles, Sean Livingston, Amar Amar Johnson. And Thorn Maker and Amir Johnson was the last person in, in uh, 2005. That's when they stopped it after the 2005 draft. He was the last person taken, and he was the 56th pick in that draft. You know, to go to the NBA. And I'm looking at this, and I'm saying to myself, if, if, if how long these guys have been playing, you know, in the league, you know. The ones that they say, I don't see how that was a formula to, to, to stop it because kids wasn't developing. Because every name I just mentioned to you right now, still, you know, they're, they're contributing part to their team, you know, still today. So I don't see how, you know, you could ever say, you know, the quality of basketball would be disrupted by bringing an 18 year old, which is what some people are saying. Uh, I, I don't. You know, because guys are getting drafted every day that stay four years and they don't necessarily start their first year. You know, they have to be developed. And, and, and I don't, I see it's a win-win situation. You, you develop a kid at 18. I'm quite sure by the time he's 20, he's going to be what you, what you expected him to be. So some of that blame has to go on the people that's developing these kids, not, not that the kids are bust. And that's why I laughed earlier when you say they're bust. You know, when I they, they call him bust, I'm like, no. Nah. Evidently, if you picked him first, he wasn't a bust. Just, somebody couldn't teach this kid what they needed to to learn to be in that uh, elite player that you wanted them to be. Right. Well, I mean, but one thing for sure, and we're going to wrap up here, is um, it seems if, again, the consensus is, as we you know go back to Zion Williamson, that he is going to be the elite player. Um, but you know it remains to be seen. But he certainly has all of the makings of it, and we'll see what happens um, once he gets to the league, assuming he does get there. 
um, and and all goes well with him. And and also too, in the short term, we'll see what happens with him. Um, you know, after he recovers from his injury, and whether or not he continues to play out this season, or if he decides to shut it down. But I'm with you. Um, either way, that's his decision to make, and we're just going to have to wait and see what he does. Yeah. And that's 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 the way I feel about it. And I wish the kid all the success in the world and whatever decision he makes. Uh, I definitely just hope he 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 doesn't, you know, injure himself any more, or you know, any worse. Right, right. All right. Well, Dub, good having you again, man. You're talking, you know, kicking around. Um, you know, college basketball. Some issues that are going on in college basketball and. We'll have you, you know, we look forward to having you back again. We'll just continue the conversation on all things hoops. So thanks for taking some time out today. And and um, we're, we're going to be talking to, uh, to you real soon. Thanks a lot, Jeff. And thanks for having me today, man. And like I said, I'll, I'll definitely stay in touch. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. I always enjoy talking with Larry Williams because he provides a knowledgeable perspective on the game of basketball while always keeping it real. We look forward to having him back on a regular basis, dishing on the latest issues and trends in basketball. Until then, that's it for this week. As always, thanks for tuning in. It's a pleasure spending time with you, and we look forward to doing it all again on our next edition of Sports. 360.